and do. Those who can't talk about those who can. Now, can you or can you not? No, you just want to sit on the sideline and talk about other people, or can you step up? Mm. Well, good Sunday morning, friends. Mark Holmes here with my buddy Cowboy Joe Boo. And as always, I want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. Hope everybody's having a great Sunday. It is, of course, we are a little over 24 hours away from legal tampering. Buy that at 12 o'clock Eastern tomorrow. Um, teams can officially start talking to agents, not the players. They can't bring them in for visits and things like that yet. But they can start talking to agents. They cannot finalize contracts until Wednesday after 4 o'clock. And my wife turns down the lights in the studio, so that's why it went dark. Um, so tomorrow starts, it will be big and we're going to be live streaming tomorrow, starting 12 o'clock, um, with the free agent frenzy. We've heard the Dallas Cowboys say that they're going to be all in, which we don't know exactly what Jerry Jones means by that, but you can best believe it's not what we think it's going to be. It's kind of cool because, um, last night, one of my brothers from another mother, Law Nation called me last night and we were talking. And, you know, here's what's kind of cool about YouTube. I have been, my first channel was actually established in 2012 uh, when I did a lot of stuff on Facebook. You know, I was really doing more on Facebook and so on. I do videos on YouTube and it might get 20 or 30 views. And, you know, for four years, it didn't do anything. Not until um, a video that I did about Dak Prescott. And in that video, I said, this is right after the Senior Bowl, that Dak Prescott was the perfect quarterback for the Cowboys. And nobody watched it until Tony Romo got injured. And that started me getting to my first 1,000 subscribers on my birthday in October of 2016. And since that time, it's been a steady climb. We're over 95,000. Shout out to you guys. It's been a long, long road, but it's been a wonderful road getting here. But back in those days, you know, I started live streaming in 2016 when it was something relatively new here on YouTube. And at that time, YouTube was like the wild, wild west. You know, ESPNs and, you know, all of those guys, they looked down upon YouTube. You know, that's not real media. What is this crap? Huh. You know, you'd say, I'm a YouTuber. It's like, you look at this cockroach here. And now they're all coming. And on a daily basis, I always see now new Cowboys content creators uh, coming in there. And shout out to you. It's, it's getting to be a crowded space. But if you look, some of the innovations, some of the things that are done um, on YouTube on a regular now were started by Vash Lombardi and Law Nation. They were the first ones to do play breakdown and stuff. They were the innovators. And when you started listening to Vosh, and I remember being at the uh, draft in 2018 and meeting Vosh and live streaming from the draft there, he was like, I called him machine gun, because he was like a machine gun with all of the stats and all the facts and everything else about each one of these college players. And I said, that guy knows more than anybody at ESPN that's a so-called draft expert. And... It was basically Shango, Vosh, me. And at that time, the Cowboys didn't even come in to YouTube till like 2019, 2018. And of course, they've blown up because they're the Dallas Cowboys. But um, talking, and sh shout out to them, shout out to them. There's so many great content creators out there that do Dallas Cowboys, from Big Game James to, to my man CFO Sports and... Um, uh, Skywalker Steel, you know, you, you know, my, my own guys, uh, E2 Blue and DMV, um, Game Time Brian and Prime Time Phil. There's so many out there that, you know, there's a niche for you to bring you everything that you want and the form that you want it in. But in talking to my man Law last night, you know, we were having a discussion and said, you know, about the culture and we were talking about, um, I, I said, I said, look, Law, do you think that this is going to be the status quo, 
You know, I said, I'm sitting here looking at the Cowboys and saying they haven't done much, if anything, to get ready for free agency. I said, you know, it's not hard for them to get money if they want to. I said, you know, it's as easy as they did Zach Martin. I said, they could surprise us on Monday and all of a sudden hit the triggers on a couple of contracts and have some money to be able to make some moves. And Law Nace's response to me was, he said, you know, he said, I know you barbecue. He said, you know, how do you barbecue? And this is what I love about Law. I, I, you know, Law is, is getting older and wiser where he is using different metaphors to make the arguments. And I love it because I caught him the other day where a guy said, we need to move on with Dak Prescott and everything else. You know, Dak, it's, it's, I'm done with Dak and all. And Law turns to him and says, he said, well, let me ask you this, you know, your car. He said, what if you got rid of your car today? Right? And this is the only car you got. He said, um, then tomorrow, going to work, you got to walk. He said, you may not like your car. You may not like your car, but it sure beats walking. And I was like, yeah. He, he turned that guy. He's like, yeah, I guess you're right on that one. Because we look around the NFL and here it is, the Vikings are still on the fence on whether or not to bring back Kirk Cousins. We we have the Atlanta Falcons saying, well, let's bring in Kirk Cousins there. You know, there'll be a market for Jimmy G out there after disappointing the last couple of years. You know, although people will say, well, he's been to a Super Bowl and stuff, but he threw two interceptions in the fourth quarter. Part of the San Francisco recent history of choking in the Super Bowl. So Law says to me, he says, when you barbecue, he said, you, you got a certain way. I said, you do it, right? I said, yeah. I said, I got my smoker. I said, it's got to be low and slow. I said, you know, I get it at 220 degrees, and I keep it right there, keep that smoke going on it. And I said, depending on if it's ribs or if it's pork, pork shoulders and pork butts, you know, I said, it's going to be, you know, like 15 to 18 hours. He said, do you, are you going to change how you make that pork? I said, ah, I see what you're doing there, Law. I see what you I Okay. He said, so in other words, don't expect the Cowboys to change how they've been doing business, which is kind of disappointing. It, it really is. So, yeah, that's where we are with the Cowboys. Now, I talked yesterday when I was working on putting out the porch swing yesterday in the rain and things about the Cowboys seeming to have hard times making decisions on things that should be the easier ones. You know, you're Denver, and right now you're staring down and saying, we've got to start this thing over. You know, Russell Wilson is too expensive, even though we're going to take an $80 million cap hit. You know, uh, Jerry Judy, I I'm sure they would have liked to have gotten more than a fifth and a sixth round pick, but they recognize we can't keep going. We have to get rid of these contracts and create some salary cap room and start the clock over. And so here we are with Michael Gallup, who... Unfortunately, it's the Cowboys' fault on this. And I'm, I'm going to bring this up, and I don't mean to sully Michael Gallup, but last night, late last night, Saturday night, you hear that the Cowboys are giving permission to Michael Gallup to seek a trade. Well, if Jerry Judy, who was healthy and has you know better seasons over the last three years than Michael Gallup, gets a fifth and a sixth for him, what do you think the market is for a guy who has been under 500 yards the last three years and had an ACL tear that and does not seem to be what he was before. Here's the thing. When we look at Michael Gallup's career, 2018 is rookie year. The first half of the season was not nothing special. The second half of the season in 2018, he came on. He came on like gangbusters and said, okay, you know, made you feel like, okay, this guy's going to be a player. And he wowed you in 2019. With 1,107 yards, 16.8 yards, you said this guy is our deep threat. But then things started to go south in the COVID year of 2020, 843. And then the next year kind of was a bunch of injuries. And his numbers dropped off a cliff from 843 to 445. And that's when he tore his ACL in the playoffs. The thing is, is if you were looking at going downhill for two years, why did the Dallas Cowboys say, we want to lock you up to a long-term deal? 
a $57 million deal. And in that time, since then, you got 424 and 418. And it seemed like every time, and, and I'm not blaming this on Michael Gallup, but it seemed like every time we were going in Michael Gallup's direction, bad things would happen. I, it, it just seemed like we'd get a penalty, we'd get an interception. Just bad things would end up happening last year. And so now here it is. The Cowboys have eighteen, uh, excuse me, thirteen point nine million dollars for this year. I pointed out yesterday. It's like um, the Cowboys. The clock is ticking. That if they don't release him before the fifteenth, then that's four million dollars. That's more. That's guaranteed on his contract. As it stands, the best scenario is you end up releasing him now. And you make him a June 1st cut where you'll get $9.5 million in cap relief after June 1st and then incur the rest um, next year. You're still going to pay the 13.8, but then it's not as much money in one season. You're still going to have 13.8 in debt. So the thing is, is if you're talking about taking Michael Gallup and saying, let's um, cut him. Let's go ahead and, or, or let's seek a trade. The thing is, is anybody seeking a trade for Michael Gallup, they're going to have to incur the cost of him, as in the rest of the contract. So somebody is, if they're going to trade for Michael Gallup, they're going to have to give you draft compensation, and they're going to take on his contract, that's $13 million a year, for the next three years. And the thing of keeping him, if you keep him for another year, the cap hit actually will go up for dead money. So it's been kind of a no-brainer, at least in my mind, that you have to move on from Michael Gallup. And I don't expect anybody to um, make a trade offer for him to take on that contract. And typically, when you get to this point where they say, seek a trade, um, it doesn't work out. Uh, you know, Derek Carr, remember? They said, hey, seek a trade. Russell Wilson has been given permission to seek a trade. You know, um, it doesn't work. Nobody's going to look and say, we're going to give you something when you know that you are going to have to cut them. We'd rather take our chances going against everybody else to get that player in our fold than we would to go ahead and give you compensation. So that's where we are with the Michael Gallup situation. And it's sad because... You know, you get attached to players. You end up wanting to root for them and see, wanting to see them succeed. But sometimes it just doesn't work out. So as we come down this home stretch, i got to actually run back home today and uh, probably do a live stream from my home up there and then come back here tonight. Three days, this was on Friday, but tomorrow legal tampering begins, and that's where teams can start making those deals. Uh, like we had said, and this is things that they would like to see happen. People would like to see Saquon Barkley with the Cowboys. We'll see. Today is legal tampering, my two favorite words in sports, and then the new league year begins. And so I'm going to give you my Friday green list of the top five offseason moves I would like to see. At five, I'll start with the obvious, and that is Kirk Cousins to the Falcons. Everything is pointing that way. Everything feels like it should be pointing in that way. The offense that it appears they're going to run, which is coming from the Rams, is perfectly suited for him. I want to see those weapons with a legitimate quarterback and a legitimate chance. In a winnable division, I think Kirk Cousins makes the Falcons an actual Super Bowl contender. And it also opens up the space for number four. I think Russell Wilson's best bet is the Vikings. I think if the Vikings do lose Kirk Cousins, then they may be in the business of drafting a quarterback at number 11, maybe someone who isn't ready mm. to start yet. That's a spot that Russell Wilson could walk into with the dynamic receivers they have there. He could put up big numbers and actually resurrect his career. I would like to see Russell in Minnesota. At number three, I've been banging the drum for Saquon to the Cowboys. I think what they need is a dynamic playmaker. I think Saquon is the closest thing we have in this league to Christian McCaffrey. He could have that kind of impact on this team if given the chance. Look what he's done on terrible offenses over the years. I think he would have a chance with a good quarterback and a good creative offense to be a huge difference maker. At number two, I want the Jets to sign every offensive lineman. <laughs> 
Literally Love everyone. It. I don't care who they are. Dan Graziano will give me a list of all of the available offensive linemen and even some who aren't, and I want all of them on the team. In fact, I'm already talking to Damian Woody about the workout regimen I'm going to put him through this summer because I think we're going to need him. The Jets need offensive linemen in the worst way. I'll take them any way I can get them. And then at number one, at the risk of sounding like a broken record because I know I've been beating this drum, maybe I am Justin Fields' last fan. I cannot believe the way that the league is turning up its nose at the possibility of acquiring a player this talented for this little compensation. The idea that a second round pick is much too much to consider giving up for a player with the upside that Justin Fields has, a player who turned 25 years old this week, mm -hmm. his career is just beginning. And I think he could have a monstrous second act somewhere. So those are the five moves I would like to see get made. Justin Fields would be one. The Jets, Lord knows we need the help. Saquon, Russell Wilson, and Kirk Cousins. In the meantime, as far as Fields is concerned, again, today is the one-year anniversary of the day the Bears made that trade last year. Here was Adam Schefter earlier this week saying there are so many moving parts with Fields, that might be why this is taking so long. The issue is there's so many moving parts at the quarterback position, and they're going to have to find somebody who specifically wants Justin Fields to fit that team's offense and is willing to surrender the draft pick compensation that it will take mm -hmm. to get him. So there are some variables here that Chicago is working through, which I think has delayed the process a little bit. I think there are people within that organization that would like to see him stay there too, which is just one more little wrench to throw in there. A lot going on with Justin Fields. It should be sorted out here in the next week. Okay, so let me start with Graziano on that. What are we hearing as far as Fields, this trade market which has turned out to be so much less than well, I expected it to be? Where are we? Again, we don't know about so much less. What we know is it's not what the Bears hoped it would be, at least initially, right? So they come back from the combine and they get into this regrouping phase. Like, all right, so what do we do? Let's wait out the Kirk Cousins situation, the Baker Mayfield situation, maybe the Russell Wilson situation, <laughs> and then maybe the market changes. Maybe now we can get an offer that's closer to what we were hoping for than what's out there. And then if we don't, then maybe we take what the best thing is and move on. Mm -hmm. But the Bears, as we've said many times, are, are going to be deliberate about this process. They are. They Ryan Poles said, their GM said at the Combine, he wants to get him traded by the start of free agency to do right by Justin. But more than that, Poles' responsibility is to do right by the Bears and get a good deal. So if, he, if the deals aren't what they want, then they wait and they see how the market settles and maybe there are some suitors there that weren't there last week or maybe some of them are more motivated. So look, Harry, you and I were having a conversation about what Justin Fields would look like in Atlanta with all of those weapons and the creative offense you might be able to design. Now, far better football minds than mine, which of course I'm just a fan at the end of the day, tell me that the offense they brought in with Raheem Morris and Zach Robinson, that that's just the opposite of what you would expect them to do with Justin Fields. So, so where is it? Wh who should be calling right now Chicago and saying, yes, Justin Fields, I'm willing to give him a chance. I'm willing to make him my starting quarterback. I'm willing to bet that he can turn into something special. Well, he here are a few teams that, that I have in mind. Um, watching the Minnesota situation, right, if you're not going to re-sign Kirk Cousins, that's a spot that Justin mm -hmm. Fields could potentially go, the Pittsburgh Steelers. We know Luke Getze is the offensive coordinator for the Las Vegas Raiders, so Justin Fields has been with Luke Getze previous, previously in Chicago, and then the Atlanta Falcons as well. So, But here's what's dynamic about the whole Kirk Cousins situation when it comes to Fields. When I look at the Atlanta Falcons and I look at the offense that they're going to be running, well, it's the same offense that Kirk Cousins has been in his entire career. Mm -hmm. right. So now when you have your offensive install, you have a veteran quarterback that can really unlock these young offensive weapons that you have and help teach things mm -hmm. versus having a quarterback trying to learn things. Mm -hmm. That's the difference when you look at Kirk Cousins right now, in my opinion, than Justin Fields in Atlanta. You have Kirk Cousins who's thrived in this offensive system his entire career, and he can help guide and teach things on the fly versus trying to learn an offensive system. Right, and it makes all the sense in the world, and that's why we put him there at the beginning of the green list today. All those things make sense. Kirk Cousins to Atlanta makes sense. Justin Fields then to Minnesota feels risky only because trading a young quarterback in your own division right. comes 
that's fraught with peril, yes? And, and since polls got there, the Bears have not shied away from making trades in the division. It's been something they've done, and you've seen other, like Detroit has done it a couple times in that same division. So, but yes, to your point, if it's a quarterback, that does give you pause. If this guy goes and becomes a star, and now we got to play him twice a year, and then we miss on the pick, oh boy, that's tough. I, I just find it hard um, to see, hard to visualize Minnesota only for, for this reason, because we know the head coach, Kevin O'Connor, the play caller, that's the same system they run down in Atlanta, basically. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Zach that's Robinson. That same offense. Yeah, and it, so it just doesn't, like, it doesn't, and mm -hmm. obviously you're in, in the same division. So where? Who? I think to who? Harry's point, though, that's critical. You mentioned he turned well, 25 well, hold on, guys. on Tuesday. Hold on, hold on, hold, right? hold on for a second. Yeah, yeah, Harry. Hold on, hold on for a second. Because the system that the Pittsburgh Steelers are running is the same offensive system as well. So we keep yeah. putting Justin Fields in Pittsburgh. Well, Arthur Smith ran a version of that Shanahan system as well. So everybody's running it. But, but the point, like oh, there you go. point earlier about how you're going to have to still work on Justin Fields, right? Like Minnesota makes, like, again, take him out of the division. Minnesota makes some sense if yeah. they're starting over at quarterback. This is a guy who's got a little bit of a jump on it as opposed to a rookie, but he still needs work on his game. Let me bounce one off you. And a, a, a genius by the name of Dan Graziano mentioned this on my radio show the other day. How about the Giants? I like that one. How about if the Giants, Daniel Jones, yeah. when is he going to be healthy enough to right. practice? Let, let's, ta let's take out of the equation. He feels to get every offseason rip. That's right? the point. <laughs> right. You make the point. You, you yeah. made it on my radio uh, show uh, the other day. I, I will say that makes a lot of sense because... Look at the work that Brian Dable did with Josh Allen. Uh huh. And you talk about a similar athletic profile. Mm -hmm. You know, Josh Allen, when he came into the league, wasn't the most accurate type of guy. But look what Brian Dable did with him and got him to be where the quarterback that he is right now. I mean, if you're gonna, if you're just gonna write down a list of the traits of the two quarterbacks. Justin Fields and Daniel Jones, there'd be some similarities, but Fields would be way better at all of them. Mm -hmm. Fields is cheap this year while you still have Daniel Jones. Cheap. He doesn't get expensive till next year when Daniel Jones is gone. I think it makes a ton of sense. I have no idea if they're going to do it. No, neither do I. In but fact, guys, I don't expect them to guys, do it. Guys, here, here's, here, here's the thing about the New York Giants. We're thrusting Justin Fields in the same situation that he started in in Chicago. So how much better is Justin Fields going oh, to be able to get? They trouble. have yeah, an offensive yeah. line problem. They yeah. have a skill position problem right now. So That's we're true. putting them in the same situation that he started in in Chicago. The bottom line is we got to find him a job, though. I mean, someone has to decide they want Justin Fields to be their quarterback. And, and look, I, I get it. Maybe I'm the only person.